thankfully uh, one uh, group of organisms we don't need to worry about ethically not for themselves anyway is plants uh, occasionally uh, someone asks well aren't can't plants feel pain um, no, for all sorts of reasons this seems extremely unlikely that there could be no selection pressure in favour of energetically expensive nervous uh, systems in any organism without the capacity for rapid self-propelled motion. So uh, in the case of uh, plants with their uh, cellulose uh, cell walls, um, no, uh, I I essentially not subjects of experience we can behave uh, as we choose towards plants could uh, obviously one has to take seriously the possibility that one might be mistaken but any form of animism is not really consistent with the scientific world picture there is a, a discipline in evolutionary aesthetics that explains the kind of things the average human finds beautiful Evolutionary aesthetics explains many of our preferences for uh, a degree of open uh, countryside, not too many places for lions to be hiding, blue sky, the kinds of environment that were conducive to the reproductive success of our ancestors on the African savanna. Uh, and sure enough, uh, like many people, I do enjoy the beauties of nature so long as I'm not thinking too closely of what they involve. In terms of post-humans, what will post-human aesthetics be like? I think this is very, very difficult to say. For a start, immersive virtual reality will enable each of us to live in designer paradises of our own choosing, if we want to. Uh, if you like the, the virgin wilderness without the nasty Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, but as well as that, one of the consequences of understanding molecular biology of the brain is that it will be possible to isolate the molecular signature of beauty and radically enrich and amplify our aesthetic sensibilities. And it may well be that post-human life, life, for example, is generically sublimely beautiful to an extent that just isn't physiologically feasible today. Yes, I, mean, I, I could talk a little bit about my conception of the good life, but I think the point of the abolitionist project, paradise engineering, is not is, is, is that it's not a case of any one person's uh, utopian vision or engineering. On the contrary, by recalibrating the hedonic treadmill, it simply enables you to lead a kind of life and be the kind of person you would like to be if nature had been, had been kinder. Yes, why has nature not invented the wheel, given it might seem that uh, uh, creatures that uh, uh, possessed uh, uh, wheels would be much more successful than those uh, that didn't? Uh, the reason seems to be that uh, uh, that kind of locomotion would entail crossing gaps in the evolutionary fitness landscape that are prohibited by natural selection. Well, sometimes Here's the counter-argument of paradise engineering that it would need, lead to uniformity and a, a, a lack of diversity, with diversity, the assumption being, is somehow inherently good. But though in one sense phasing out cystic fibrosis or depression leads to greater uniformity, in another sense genetic engineering, biotechnology, opens up the opportunity for fabulously greater uh, a variety and richness because we can design uh, genomes in principle at any rate design life forms and states of consciousness that could not could not have evolved by natural selection if we have if, if there is uh, uh, life that exists elsewhere in our Hubble volume we discover life uh, and we're talking about primordial life here not uh, engineered life, then I think it's highly likely if it's multicellular that there will be predation, uh, that uh, there will be some form of convergent evolution. You'll, we, one will find probably the same Darwinian principles of natural selection. 
Um, that's not to say, I mean, when, uh, if and when organisms evolve sufficiently cognitively sophisticated to master science, to be capable of re-engineering themselves, editing their own genetic source code, then all bets are off, uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, if today we were to discover life elsewhere in the galaxy, primordial life, one might well find that it was not radically different from traditional life on Earth, i.e. it would probably be carbon-based and reliant on liquid water. Uh, this isn't, as it may sound, uh, uh, arbitrary carbon chauvinism, but it seems that the properties of uh, the valence properties of carbon are functionally unique, the properties of liquid water are functionally unique, and no other chemistry for primordial life seems to be feasible, or at least one can make a case this is so. Of course, I could be completely uh, uh, confounded here, but uh, tentatively that would be my prediction.